If you have your Bibles, open them up to Galatians chapter 5. We want to hit the concluding message of this series. Ministering on self-control today. Self-control. And as I have many times, I just want to say thank you for uh, your desire to grow and to learn through God's Word. Uh, I pray that the fruit of the Spirit is being reproductive in your life, but will continue to be reproduced uh, within your life. I say thank you to Pastor Joe for um, his sermon on faithfulness. Thank you to Pastor Ken for his message on, um, on patience. Uh, it's great to have other people in the church that can help minister the revelation of God. Uh, to each one of each one of us, uh, Paul, as we're going to read here in just a moment, uh, concludes his list on the fruit of the spirits with self-control. Self-control. This particular expression of the fruit of the spirit is is significant when we realize the context of the statement as including the works of the flesh described just before that in Galatians 5, 18 through 21, which we'll read here in just a, a few moments. I think we can realize from the dawn of, of human history, people of all cultures and nationalities have sought to incorporate laws, restrictions, on lower appetite, inclinations, and actions of those who give themselves over to what we would classify as a life of selfish dissipation and uncontrolled behaviors. Most of our laws, restrictions, are identified because we realize most people struggle to control their own life. They, 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 they struggle to control their thoughts, their appetites, their inclinations, as, I, as I've identified. And without a right thought process, they many times just act. History provides us with documentary record that shows that External laws that prohibit and restrict and penalize have not solved the problem of controlling incl evil inclinations in people's hearts. Laws that restrict and penalize are, I believe, absolutely essential for maintaining a stable society. However, humanity's greatest need is not for external control, but what we recognize is that inward self-control. That inward self-control. The writer of Proverbs makes this statement. In Proverbs 16, 32, He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit than he who takes a city. Another Proverbs, Proverbs 25, verse 28, tells the tragedy of a person without self-control. To catch this, a man without self-control is like a city broken And left without walls. Mm. Self-control. I think we obviously can look into the greater humanity of society. And recognize there's a great difficulty. In controlling ourselves. Self-control. Sometimes more than anything else. In life. Look here in Galatians 5. Pick up with me in the, in the 16th verse. One more time. It reads, So I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do what you want to do. Catch verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual morality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, dis 
discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those, catch this, who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. But catch 22, but the fruit of the spirits is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified this sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, or envying each other. Father, we say thank you for your word this morning. Lord, how wonderful is your word. How beautiful is your words. Lord, I just pray that we gasp, grasp the revelation, God, that you have for each one of us. Lord, that we might walk in your enlightenment. Lord, that truly the, the fruit of the Spirit would be cultivated, God, that it would be reproduced. Lord, not just through the context of this, this sermon series, God, but day by day, month by month, year by year within our lives, God, that we, that we exhibit a greater measure of your love, of your joy, your peace, your patience, Lord, all the way down to a greater measure of self-control within our lives, that inward self-control. God, may our hearts be fertile soil to receive your truth this morning. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I want to give you five thoughts of revelation this morning in regards to self-control. Uh, I, I know I don't have the bulletin for you this morning. If you missed the notes and you want them, just call me, email me. I'll just send you my whole notes if that'll make it easier for you. Uh, but I want to give you five thoughts that we can gain through God's Word and through the revelation of God's Spirit uh, into our lives. Number one, uh, self-control is one of the great gifts of God for each one of us. It's one of the great gifts of God for each one of us. It is God's will that we live in control over our own lives. It's God's will for each one of us. The Holy Spirit came to give us the strength of soul that is necessary for a person to take control over their own life. A, a mastery of self always adds dignity and poise to one's character. I, I, I want to use the remainder of this morning's message to, to begin to uncover the reality of those statements that I just gave you. But let me give you three thoughts within this being one of the great gifts of God for each one of us. Now, number one, we must believe that the Holy Spirit wants us to maintain, maintain control over our attitudes, our appetites, and our ambitions and actions of life. God's Spirit desires, God's Holy Spirit desires that we maintain control of those desires within each one of us. Number two, we must believe that the Holy Spirit will assist us. He's not saying we, we want you to maintain control and simply says, good luck, I hope you accomplish this. No, the Holy Spirit wants to assist us to maintain control over our emotions, our moods, our imaginations, and also, I believe, our thoughts. We need help. I, I realize that I need help. Number three, we must believe that the Holy Spirit will assist us in maintaining control over our temper, our tongue, our talents, our treasure, and our time. We, we need the help of the Holy Spirit within our lives. I, I, I saw a shirt the other day that says so, sometimes my tongue gets bored and words just roll off of it. The idea that it's trying to create some form of excitement in, into their lives. I, I think we've all been guilty at one point or time of saying something and wishing, boy, I, can I get that back? But it's gone. Please understand the, the epistle teaches James, the hardest to control is the tongue. The tongue. Sometimes we speak blesses and curses out of the same tongue. That ought not to be. How could that ever happen? We speak life and death, the Bible says, out of the tongue, according to the book of 
of Proverbs. How, how do we keep from speaking curses? How, how do we keep from speaking death into somebody else's life? How, how can our words be seasoned with that uncommon love, that joy, that peace, that patience, that kindness, that, that meekness that we've identified through the, the context of this series? How, how can these be exemplified through our lives, through, through the work of the Holy Spirit maintaining control over our inward self-being, that, that our talents, our treasures, our time, our, our temper. There, there's a big one. Our, our te- you, you ever known somebody to struggle with their temper? How, how many of you, do you have a spouse or a child that struggles with, don't raise your hand. No. <laughs> we don't want to see it exemplified this morning. You, you found somebody who struggles with their temper. You know, people who struggle with the flesh, with emotions, with thoughts, they've often said, well, this is just how God created me. That's a lie. We've allowed that to grow within us, yet God's Spirit wants us to control that, wants to assist us in helping to control that. Understand this morning, church, that this is one of the great gifts that God gives us, blesses us with, is the reality of self-control. Secondly, for you this morning, self-control is basic to the Christian life. One more time, self-control is basic to the Christian life. A, A disciple is one, catch this, who has voluntarily accepted the discipline of being a follower of Jesus Christ. You you weren't forced into being a follower of Jesus Christ. You you volunteered. You received the calling upon your life and you said, yes, I need this Jesus. You made a choice to volunteer to surrender your life to the working of Christ, the working of God's Spirit upon your life. That word disciple and that word discipline, we realize, have the same base root meaning. Those who consider themselves to to be disciples fool themselves if they do not recognize that this involves the discipline of being a genuine follower of Jesus Christ. It takes discipline to become a disciple of Jesus. It takes work. It it, it takes an extreme amount of energy to want to, to, to discipline myself that I might become the right disciple of Jesus. That means I have to let go of things. That means that I I might have to forgo things. The the writer of Hebrews says that i got to throw off those things that so easily entangle my life. Hear me this morning, church. It takes discipline to throw off those things. To let go of them. Because everything inside of my flesh is wanting to hold on to it. It's wanting to be captivated by, by those desires of the flesh. If we're to learn the art of self-mastery, it begins by being willing to yield ourselves to the greatest master who's ever learned, that being Jesus Christ. Lord, I want to surrender to you and make you the master, the Lord of my life. The Holy Spirit wants to give us self-restraint, self-control, self-denial, and self-discipline that will enable us to to restrain ourselves in in the presence of temptation at every turn. I wonder, was anybody tempted by anything this morning? And only, okay, there's two of us this morning. Okay, a few more. Temptation is not a sin. Was anybody tempted by anything this morning? Okay, I just want you to know that that's not bad. Okay, let me help. Was anybody tempted by anything this week? What world do some of y'all live in? I mean, I face temptation every day of my life. The Apostle Paul faced it every day. I like to know what culture you live in that I'm not there, that you don't face temptation. 
For the Apostle Paul says that I must crucify my flesh daily. What, what was the Apostle Paul identifying is that I face temptations every day of my life, but every day I have to crucify my flesh. Every day I have to, uh, I have to receive the help, the mastery of, of my Lord Jesus Christ to remain, to remain self-controlled, an inner self-control of my life. Because everywhere I go, everywhere I look, there's the experience of temptation. Self-control is part of our spiritual heritage. The Holy Spirit is eager to assist us in living a victorious Christian life. Jesus desires that we live a life of victory. But I can't do it without self-control. I can't do it without yielding myself to the works of Jesus. To the leading of the Holy Spirit. The works of the Holy Spirit. So understand that, that self-control is really basic to the Christian life. Number three for you, self-control, as I've already alluded to before, is inward and voluntary. Inward and voluntary. All of us, catch this, all of us must accept responsibility for all that we are and all that we do. I want you to gain that. All of us must accept responsibility for all that we are and all that we do. We can't deceive ourselves by blaming somebody else for who we are and for what we do. That's what this world does. That's what this world does. Well, if they wouldn't have said that to me, then I wouldn't have said that. If they wouldn't have done that, then I wouldn't have done that. It's always somebody else's fault. We're trying to give ourselves an out for how we respond. That's not self-control. That's not the working of God's Spirit. One more time, I, I said it's inward and it's voluntary. It, you, you know, Joe, you, you worked in the prison for many years. I don't know, maybe it's different. I, I don't know if you were in the court system much, just after the court system. Yeah, it's always somebody else did it, right? Oh, yeah. They're not in there for their own mistake. It's that somebody else compelled them to do what it is that they did. How many of you have kids? This, this might help you identify this. Anybody got kids? Been blessed with kids? Good, a few of us. Isn't it interesting when you get onto one of your kid, but they made me do it. Right? It's not my, my kids aren't the only ones that do this, is it? Now, that doesn't happen very often with mine, but it, it happens. They, they made me do that. Nobody makes you do anything. Do you, do you hear me this morning, church? You know, I talked about driving last week. I could use that illustration every week. It, it happened again this week. It just, it's amazing. I, 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 my new calling may be teaching driver's ed. <laughs> We, we need new driver's ed teachers. I'm convinced that they teach it wrong. Or better yet, somebody's just not listening. That's probably what's going on here. You know, I, I drive up to a four-way stop. Anybody ever been to a four-way stop before? You know, you drive up and uh, anybody ever heard that term right away? Anybody knows what that means? Because this is my new calling is driver's ed. So I want to make sure you get this. I've told my, my daughters have heard this over and over. I'm like, man, I need to start teaching that class. You know what right away means? If two of you come to the intersection at the same time, or let's just say close to the same time, who goes first? Oh, so you were in that class too. Good. It must just be everybody else. So I, I, I drive up to this stop sign this week, which it, every week, and, and there's this car that, forget getting there at the same time, they stop before me. 
So I'm waiting for them to go. I even motion for them to go. They, they are actually, they're just sitting there. So I'm like, forget it. I just hit the gas and go. Every time I hit the gas, Brother Doug, guess what they do? Now I sat there and waited for you to go. Do you think that I stop once they hit the gas? No, because remember last week I told you too many defensive drivers. I'm the offensive driver. So once I hit the gas, I go. That's your fault for waiting at that point. Misty, are you still with me this morning? They can say whatever in the world they want to say about me. But yet I've got to control myself. I'm telling you, when I drive, I just say, Lord, I need help. That tests my self-control more than any other time. Lord, help, help me. I, I could give you a thousand circumstances from this week. But my words, my actions can't be blamed on somebody else. They're my words. They're my choices. They're my actions. I've got to choose. There's no external force that can compel us to practice self-control. This is a way of life that we must choose for ourselves. And we must learn to depend on the workings of the Holy Spirit inside of each one of us. Let me give you number four this morning. Self-control is exceedingly difficult. I, I want you to understand this. It's, it's not easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of persevering. You might even make a few mistakes in the journey. Why? Because self-control is exceedingly difficult. We, we live in a world that encourages us to give full release to every one of our wishes. High-pressure advertisements stimulate us to want far more than we ever need. Those compulsions... You've got to have this. You know, if you, if you don't have this, there must be something wrong with you. I, I, my, my parents are here this morning. Most of you met them. They come in every time. And I, I was no different than most any other, any other child. Well, everybody else has that. Everybody else is doing that. Jumps off the bridge. Are you going to jump with them? You heard that. But there's that, that high form of pet pressure within our lives that, that encourages us to give full release to every one of our wishes. Our, our own fleshly nature with its many appetites constantly demands us to want to satisfy that fleshly nature. A wise teacher once said this, Character is developed only as a man resists his inward inclinations toward evil. I'm going to give it to you one more time. Character is developed only as a man resists his inward inclinations toward evil. We must keep a tight rein on ourselves, our desires. And can I say this? Never relax. Because when you have that momentary relax... It's probably then that you do something you know you ought not to do. It's a continual discipline over and over. The devil, the devil constantly works to tempt and seeks to promise the fulfillment of every desire that we have, providing we let him control our lives. Very deceptive, very, very cunning within our lives. These factors, when combined, present a real problem to the person who recognizes the need for self-control. The devil's there always. The Bible says like a lion prowling, looking to devour someone, looking for the next opportunity, looking to kill, to steal, and to destroy. But Jesus says that I've come that you might have life, that you might have it more abundantly. Self-control, catch this, is not a permanent achievement so much as it is a way of life to be practiced moment by moment. I, I'm not convinced that we ever arrive... That we ever arrive. It's a continual practice. It's a continual discipline that, that matures, that grows inside of each one of us. The moment that I believe that I have arrived, Proverbs tells us that pride comes before a fall. 
a haughty spirit before destruction. The moment that we say, I think I've got this under control, guess what comes next? Here comes the slip. Here comes that piece of ice that we, well, we don't have ice here. There's that oil on the road that we didn't know was there. It causes us to slip out of control. It's to become a way of life where we practice moment by moment. Number five for you this morning. The self-controlled life is simply a spirit-controlled life. A self-controlled life is a spirit-controlled life. If we desire to experience the fruit of the spirits and be in control of our faculties, our inclinations, our appetites, every aspect of our life, there are certain essential responses that we need to make toward the indwelling work of the Holy Spirit. Let me identify these responses for you this morning as I begin to work to conclude this morning's message. I've got six of them, six responses for us this morning. Number one, we must recognize the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit who has come to be with us always. We've got to recognize the Holy Spirit. I've got to wake up and say, welcome, Holy Spirit. I, I've got to wake up and say, Holy Spirit, I, I need you this morning. I, I need your help. I, I've got to recognize, we've got to recognize that, that abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Number two, we, we must believe in the benevolent purposes of the Holy Spirit and not distrust Him, distrust Him as He seeks to place divine restrictions within our lives. divine restrictions I alluded to this last week everything may be permissible but it may not be right you know when an athlete begins to train they do things that they wouldn't normally do they restrict things in their life that may not be bad, but they, they want to be better prepared for the competition. They want to be better prepared for that moment in life. Sometimes when the Holy Spirit catches, this may be for somebody this morning. Sometimes the Holy Spirit, as we begin to mature in our walk with the Lord, begins to restrict things in our lives, and we fight against it, saying, well, but God's Word doesn't say that it's wrong. Doesn't matter. If God's Spirit is placing that, that seasonal, yearly, maybe even a lifetime restriction on us, then I've got I've to accept that as the working of the Holy Spirit within my life. He must know something that I don't know. He must be preparing me for something that I may not be seeing right now. It's okay. It's okay. That's, that's the practice of self-control. Uh, you, you know, let, let me help you with this. We, we just finished a 21-day fast back in the, the, in the beginning of this year, always the first three weeks of the year here at Cornerstone Church. But I, I, I make it known as we conclude that, that time, that season of fasting, that, that fasting is always good. What, what is fasting doing? It, it places restrictions on our lives. Why? Because we're wanting to press in further with God. We're desiring a greater experience with God. And, and I may not have that experience. I probably won't have that experience if I don't allow to receive the, myself to receive the restrictions of the Holy Spirit. Many times we're praying for somebody. Even the disciples experience this. Lord, Lord, we prayed and we believed, but nothing's happened. And Jesus simply says, some of these things only come about. Why? Because of prayer and also fasting. Some of you aren't experiencing that, that great moment with Jesus. Why? Because you're not receiving the restriction of the Holy Spirit within your life. It's not that it's bad. Meat's not bad. Other things aren't bad, but they may be bad in that season of restrictions. 
because it's opposite of what God has compelled through the working of His Holy Spirit. That takes self-control. I've got to respond to what it is that the Holy Spirit is making real into my life. This leads me to number three, my third response. We must learn to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit as He speaks through us through the words, His Word, and through our consciousness as well as through the circumstances of life. Hear me. There's many ways the Holy Spirit speaks, that God speaks to us through His Word audibly, through circumstances, through other people. I've got to learn to recognize the leading, the voice of the Holy Spirit within my life. I've got to be able to discern. My pastor growing up, I, I, I asked him a few times, and he always gave me the greatest, the, the same response over and over. I asked him, uh, Pastor Lepsack, what, what do you tend to pray for more than anything? He says, for discernment. I want to know the voice of God. I want to know the leading of the Holy Spirit. I've got to know that. You, you've got to know that so that we respond we respond correctly. Number four for you. We must rely on the guidance of the Holy Spirit as He seeks to enable us to understand truth about God and also about life. The Holy Spirit works to provide revelation for us, understanding within our lives. Uh, catch this scripture, John 16, 33. I, I, I love this. I've quoted this many times in my life. Jesus says, I've told you these things so that you may have peace. Understand, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. Uh, another portion of scripture declares to us that because He has overcome, you and I can also overcome in the midst of the trouble that we're experiencing. I don't know about you, but I've had a few troubles in my life. Th this may shock you. You'll experience troubles when you're in the will of God. Sometimes when you go through trouble, some will identify, well, you must be out of the will of God. No. Do you think going to the cross, being whipped, and a crown put on your head, and somebody spitting in your face, you don't think that may be some trouble of life? But don't tell me that Jesus was out of the will of God. I can go through all the prophets, all the, the patriarchs, the matriarchs of the Bible, into the apostles, the disciples in the New Testament. The apostle Paul was in prison many times, beaten many times, yet he was still in the will of God. But he says, because I have overcome, you also will overcome. I've got to receive the understanding of God's spirits. I've got to know that I'm in the right place. Now, sometimes I may be in the wrong place. But He'll make that known to me. For His Holy Spirit helps me to understand the circumstances of life. Number five. We must trust in the power of the Holy Spirit as we face life. In His power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. To be my witnesses, the Bible says, and all Jer Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Hear me, to be a light for Jesus, I need the power of the Holy Spirit. Because as a disciple, as a witness for Jesus, I have all different types of circumstances. And many of them would work to defeat to destroy my life, but I need the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome. Lastly, number six, we must cooperate with the Holy Spirit as He works within us from day to day. To cooperate. Philippians 2.13, for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to His good purposes. I've got to cooperate. I know all of these tie together, they work together, but I believe that there, there are six distinct responses to the working of the Holy Spirit. Why? So that we can live a life of self-control. That we can exemplify the works of Jesus, the words of Jesus, the love of Jesus. Hear me. As I conclude this, this morning, I believe God wants to set us free 
from the control of destructive forces, powers, habits, attitudes, and appetites within our lives. Let's be real this morning, church. Every single one of us struggle with some type of an attitude, with some type of an action, some type of an appetite, some type of a destructive force within our lives. The Apostle Paul, I, I, I love his teaching. He says, I've got this, this thorn in my flesh. I've got this nagging day in and day out. I've got this struggle day in and day out. We, we've got to be honest with ourselves. For me to say that I don't have these continual struggles is simply for me to lie to myself. But yet God wants to set us free. I believe God wants to deliver us from those destructive forces, those powers, those habits, those attitudes, those appetites within our lives. For Christ came to save us from the insanity of a life of sin and destruction. So if we want to gain mastery of ourselves, we must first let all of Jesus Christ become the Savior of our lives to set us free from the works of Satan the powers of Satan then day by day we're to be filled with the spirits and to walk in the spirits for the fruit of the spirits is self-control self-control I don't know about you this morning church I, I want to exhibit self-control once again I'm not saying it's easy I'm not saying I haven't failed because I've probably failed many times. But I want to demonstrate self-control. In my home, in my church, wherever I work, wherever I go. Because I want people to know Jesus. I want people to see Jesus. And to experience Jesus. And I believe the only way that happens is when we demonstrate a life of the fruit of the spirits. When we demonstrate that love. As we talked about nine weeks ago. That joy. That peace. That patience. Kindness. Goodness. Faithfulness. Gentleness. And self-control. All nine fruit of the spirits. Yet it's just one fruit. Why? Because they all work together as one. Where there is no self-control, there is no love. Where there is no joy, there is no patience. It's one fruit. Can we be those people? That God has purposed us to be. That church. And to exemplify that. Why? Because there's somebody that needs Jesus. You know I, I begin every Monday morning with prayer. Every day with prayer. But every Monday morning. I, I have a very similar prayer. That I pray. Lord give me an opportunity today. Lord give me opportunities this week. I left that moment of prayer and drove up to a restaurant and saw an acquaintance of mine I haven't seen in a few weeks. Went and sat next to him. Me and Hollis. Gentleman had already eaten. He's been to church here a couple times. He asked, where's your other friend? I said, my other friend's not going to make it today. I said, we're all you get. But just sat there and loved him. Encouraged him. With Jesus. Because he's been fighting a battle. The devil's been working on him. I have to practice self-control. I've got to practice love. Because I want him to know Jesus. Tyler and I went to a store this week. Looking for some stuff. And the people weren't difficult with us. But I've just... Everywhere I go, I just find myself wanting to love somebody. Wanting to engage somebody in a conversation. This lady had an interesting name. I thought it was short for something, but it wasn't. It was just her name. I asked her, I said, where are you from? Boniface, she told me she's from Congo. The Congo. That's where he... I said, you know, there's a family in our church from the Congo. I'd love to introduce you to them. Well, where's your church at? And I just begin to tell her where the church is at. I'm hoping she shows up someday. Just trying to be a light to somebody. You can do that when you live a life led by the spirits and that's what God has purpose for you